Coming up on All About Android. Oh boy, we've got a fun show for you today. It's me, Jason Howell, also Florence Ion, Ron Richards, and our guest, Sam Abuel Samid, uh, joins us for the first time. And I don't know why we haven't had him on sooner. It was so much fun. We talk about Android 12, more details leaking out. Turns out it's going to be a pretty big update when it finally hits. Alphabet, nothing, and essential, all sitting in a very strange tree together. Uh, Facebook phone. What about Facebook? watch. Yeah, you want that? I'm not so sure you do. Sam breaks down the, and differentiates uh, between Android Auto and Android Automotive. And a major running mystery of the show is not totally solved, but we get a lot closer to a real answer in the email block. All that and more next on All About Android. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by SanDisk's data storage solutions. Check out their Ultra Dual Drive Lux today and get 15% off your first order of the featured SanDisk products at sandisk.com slash AAA. And by IT Pro TV. Get a new career in IT with the best IT education around. Visit itpro.tv slash allaboutandroid for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Make sure and use code AAA30 at checkout. Hello, welcome to All About Android, episode 512, recorded on Tuesday, February 16th. 2021, your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason L. And I'm Rod Richards. And I'm Florence Ion. Hi, everybody. Hello. Flo Flo's got bangs. I got Flo's bangs. Got bangs. <laughs> yeah. I got a radical haircut now that we've reopened salons in the Bay Area. So I went and I How got exciting. Cool. It, you so know what? I have to say, great. it is. It, it was really nice to go and just like get a change. And I was in the chair for a long time because we did color correction. So I basically paid my stylist to hang out with me for four hours. Yeah. It was nice. So, it was nice. Nothing, so wrong true. With that. nothing wrong with that at all. <laughs> Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, every once in a while you got to hang out with somebody besides your family. <laughs> That's exactly. right. In person and not just on Skype, as we are doing today. Uh, joining us, uh, surprisingly, for the first time on this I know. show. Shame but on folks us. Who, who are fans of Twit have seen Sam Abu El Samid on a number of our other shows. Uh, Sam, of course, does the Will Bearings podcast and a whole bunch of other things. But Sam, you are an Android user and you are awesome. So we had to get you here. And thank you for joining us tonight. My pleasure. And, and I even have my my original Android phone here, my uh, my OG droid. Oh, which, wow, yeah. amazing. There, there it is. Still is on, guys. There it is. The but it, but is it won't. On. It, it won't. I can't get it to connect to my Gmail account. Um, it, I, there must be some security changes that have happened, and it, it doesn't want to log in anymore. So, oh, so you can't rely on the OG Droid anymore. That's a bummer. No, gonna have to use the Pixel Five, I guess. <laughs> bummer. Oh well. Oh well. Yeah, what, I do wonder why. Uh, you know what's happened. I, I guess probably you're right. It's probably some sort of an app update that has a like a permissions requirement or something that that it, old it version may, of Android does. It may does be because work. I have two factor turned on. Um, oh. And, uh, I'll have to try it with one of my other accounts that doesn't have two factor mm -hmm. on it. That could be. But I mean, that's literally one of the oldest. One of the oldest the, Android devices in existence. So it could be a the second of oldest. Things, I think after the G1, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, to my to my knowledge, that's true. Uh, Ron, you still have your G1. Have you ever tried to, or I, I'm assuming you still have it? Have you ever tried no, to like? Fun, no, it's funny. Is I actually don't. Oh. Um, I, I I I recently had one of those revelations uh, where a friend of mine was moving, and he sent me a photo of his box of phones. It's like, hey nerd, what can I do with these? And I was just like, oh, you can, you know, recycle them here or send them there or go to Best Buy. You know, I gave him the whole kind of like where you recycle your phones. And then I realized he had his G1 in the photo. I'm like, dude, oh, my God, you have a G1. I have a G1. I went to go look for it. And then I and then I, it was like almost like a repressed memory. I left it at a job in San Francisco in 2010 when we were developing an Android app and I was using it for testing. And oh. when I quit the job, I left it in the office and I had friends who worked there and I was like, oh, I'll just go back and get it. I never went back to get it and I don't yeah. know where it is now. So I'm so 
once I freaked out and realized my friend still had a G1, I was like, dude, I'll take that off your hands because I want one for my collection. And then he got all defensive. He's like, well, maybe I want to keep that one. And so, uh, <laughs> no, uh, but you were going to get for the, oh man, I, I shouldn't know, have made such a big I, deal about it. In my, in my list of life's regrets uh, right in there in the top 10 is did not hold on to my G1. So yeah, that is a bummer. I, I do still have my Motorola droid, but not well, where is it? It is, is it is here, but it's not here. I think it's out in the shed at this point. I will I will say I've got 19 other phones since then. I've got the, I've got the <laughs> next bit Robin. I've got a a bevy of Motorola devices. Yeah. I've got a ton of uh, Motorola Nexus devices that I, can't, that, that I can't update to, to the OS it, because they they're end of life. Um, yeah. I've got a bunch of One Pluses. So like I'm covered in phones, but uh, but I would have liked well, to have well, that. Well, the the upside of of Android phones depreciating so much is that there's no value in trading them in most of the time. Totally. So totally. I, right. they, I usually just end up sticking them in a stick them in a drawer and using them as a backup in case something else breaks. Yep. Yep. So Sam, I have I have a question. Like obviously, like the obvious question to ask people who have been on Android for a long time is what was your first phone? I'm a little more curious right now to know what your follow-up phone was to the Motorola Droid. What was the phone that pulled you away <laughs> from the Droid? Uh, I went I got a Droid 3 uh, a couple of years later. Um, and then I had a Droid HD Max. Uh, and Stuck then the I switched over to T-Mobile and got, uh, got the, um, uh, the Moto X, the, the second gen Moto oh, X, yeah. which oh, I yeah. loved that phone. I, I love, I love the infrared sensors on there. So if there was a call coming in, I could just wave my hand over it and dismiss the call things like that. Yeah, that was a magic. Ma was that the magical? Yeah, that was the magical Motorola era, I would say. I mean, yeah. Obviously, the droids and everything were special, and they were Motorola for their own sake. But the Moto X era, where you know, with Moto Maker and everything, that was like that was such a magical time for smartphones yeah. in the Motorola family. That was that was like their pinnacle moment, I think. In my opinion, everybody probably that, has a different opinion. That was, opinion the, as far that was as the last concerned. Moto. After that, I went Google phones. I got a six Nexus yeah. six P and a couple of Pixels. Yeah. 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 Uh, indeed. Well, you went with the Droid 3. I'm looking at it right now uh, on Wikipedia, and it's it's a lot like the first Droid. So, yeah. Pretty much, except a little bigger and a little, right. little bit better keyboard on it. Yeah. I did like the sliding yeah. keyboards. Yeah, it, it appears. And, and would you go back to a sliding keyboard now, or are you kind of now? Over? No, probably not. Yeah. You know, it's been so long that I, I couldn't bother it at this point. Right. You almost yeah. kind of have to find a reason to need to go back to them at this point. That what's what's the purpose? What's the reason? I got to yeah. tell you, though, guys, sometimes I'll just be, you know, I'll be listening to my usual, you know, corral of pop culture podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. And it, there at least every other week there's a mention of, oh, man, I really miss my Blackberry. Oh, man, I really <laughs> miss my keyboard. Um, and it's so it, you missed it, but BlackBerry brought it back right. and nobody bought it. So. Exactly. You missed it. <laughs> Did you really it. miss it? Or <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there's, there's, the idea of it. <laughs> it. It's probably a little bit of, of, of both sides, right? Like that keyboard served its purpose, purpose beautifully in that paradigm, right? At that time. And so you you miss having like like it's not that you necessarily need to have that keyboard now because we have the solution for it now. But then that was the perfect solution for then. It's not yes. for now. You know, I, yes. and I don't know Just, if the touch screen is the perfect solution for now, but we right. certainly got used to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I'll, I'll I'm tell nostalgic you what, for oh. T9. I certainly yeah. got used to it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Never, uh, I never, never I always, I never liked T9, but the, by far and away, the worst phone I ever had was the BlackBerry Storm 2. I had that. Oh, for, I remember, for, uh, I issued. remember the vitriol against that particular phone uh, model. Oh, that yeah. Atrocious. That's right. BlackBerry Storm 2. That Google was, it. Oh. <laughs> it was, yeah, just woo. pulling it up. I remember the hatred uh, that, yeah. that was all it, around yeah. BlackBerry. Oh, it crashed man, frequently. looking at it gives me, gives me who, the sweats. Yeah. <laughs> it, that it was crashed uh, frequently, and then when it when it crashed, it would take like ten minutes to reboot. It was insane. Ah, oh, that's so, not good. So that was yeah, November two thousand nine. So I'm assuming that that was the device it you was had that sure right press, before the Motorola Droid. It was that touch actually screen it was after that was complete garbage. Oh, so you got the storm. It, it was 
the the you storm was issued to me uh, by uh, work when I, at, at a job I took in 2010. So right. it had, I had already had the the droid, right. uh, but they they gave me the uh, the storm for work. Yeah, right. that, that was in, in that time period where the idea of having one phone be both things didn't really work well, so well. It was 2009. Well. The iPhone had only been out for yeah. two years. So yeah. it was still a relatively new concept. Uh, but man, the touchscreen on thing was so bad. Yeah. That's when we were still living in capacitive and... Um, oh, resistive. Re oh. Is it reflective? Resistive. I forgot the resistive. name because I haven't used the term in so long. Ugh. Yeah, resistive screen technology is just awful. So awful. And every once in a while you find devices that, that do have it. Maybe not necessarily smartphones, but other devices. It's like, oh, this used to be an entire screen on a smartphone. <laughs> no, thank I still you. have a couple of trios in the drawer with resistive screens. Oh, I love the trio. <laughs> the trio was so good. I love that phone. That really, that, that phone, like, it's it's funny because, like, with phone, with phones... At least from the moment cell phones came out, my first phone was a Qualcomm. I forget what the model was, but like 1999, I get three lines of text in text messages. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there, there are moments in time that felt like we were really moving technology forward. And I feel like the trio at the end of just the cell phone, you know, like the, the pre-smartphone era, pre, you know, mo Windows Mobile, you know, when yeah. like the, the end of like just a dumb cell phone merging with the PDA functionality, that felt like, oh, this is what the future could be like. I, right. I remember feeling that moment. So. Yeah. Uh Absolutely true. We should we should um, do a phone an Android phone nostalgia podcast. Like we, it'll be all about Android yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the news that once was. Yeah, because this week's because uh, so, th this show is about today and tomorrow. Yeah, that's so. true. Yeah. All of this is to say that Sam, you are you are perfect uh, for this for this show. So we're really happy. To yeah, have you, you are. Here. Exactly. Obviously, you have a deep history here. in Android. You, you got us going down memory lane, and it was kind of fun. I know. Thanks. <laughs> totally. All right. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. And actually, I'm really looking forward to this a little bit later in the show. We're going to talk with you, Sam, about Android Auto uh, versus Android Automotive. Um, I mentioned last week on the show that you wrote a couple of emails in that were very detailed as far as Android Automotive and the things that, uh, you know, that we were a little confused on when we had the discussion a few weeks uh, prior and uh, so yeah, that's part of the reason why I thought like, oh, we should just bring you on anyways uh, to talk about it. So we're going to talk about that with you later. In the meantime, though, we do have a whole lot of news to talk about. So, Burke, take us to the news. Now, here's the Oreo. Oh, my balls. Cone. <laughs> It's now crossed over into performance art. Yeah, yeah so, no, uh, I loved it. That was, yeah. that made me really happy, Burke. That was great. That was, so, that, was, um, uh, that was mukbang, right? That's what that was? <laughs> mukbang. <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's get into the news. Um, All right, let's do it. Android 12 must be on the horizon, my friends, uh, because it is, it is leaking left and right. And before we get into this, I just want to give everyone, normally I do this on uh, other podcasts I do about media and movies and things like that. We always do a spoiler warning. Mm -hmm. I do want to prepare our listening and watching audience that I'm about to spoil something pretty big because as you know, with every version of Android, a lot of our enjoyment of it is the speculation of what the uh, dessert name will be. In fact, we did it last week, right, Jason? We were talking about yeah. S-named uh, uh, ones. Well, in the latest round of leaks about Android 12, XDA uh, reveals a ton of details, including what the internal name or the dessert name is. And I'm, and I'm going to spoil it for you now. I'm sorry. Stop listening, but then come back. Whatever. Don't stop listening. You want to listen. Yeah. Uh, it is called Snow Cone. Oh, Which now makes me like go. go duh. Of course, S dessert snow cone. That's that's a great one. If we had a few more months of speculation, I think we would have figured it out. I'm just saying. Yeah, um, it would have come up. But yeah, point. that was quick. I feel that like this one is really anticlimactic. Like I really was sort of robbed of an experience. Totally kind of stolen. Totally kind agree. of stolen from us. Kind of taken yeah. away. I'm a little upset. Yeah. Maybe they did this and in advance, we knowing that we were we're onto them. So. Well, I mean, and I get it. They've been in lockdown. Get to see you guys, they've, they've been able to, you know. And we won't get to see you guys sampling snow cones every week. I know. Right. Which would be fun in that. 
It would be a ton of fun, yeah. Well, anyway, so uh, as far as more important aspects of it, um, the UI changes we saw last week are being dubbed internally as Material Next. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Mm. Um, and there are likely more UI changes coming in Android 12. Uh, those include changing the always on display and lock screen. So changes to the pattern lock, lock interface, adding device controls to lock screen and not just the power menu. Um, quick settings panel, wallpaper based theming. Um, where is it? Ah, sorry. Wallpaper based theming, changes to how app launching is presented visually, visually, um, a more flexible picture in picture mode. Uh, my favorite thing, sarcasm alert. <laughs> Uh, new floating bubble animations, uh, mm. smart auto rotate using front facing camera to detect the detect head orientation, which I like. I like that. Yeah. That's um, interesting. A, yeah. A game mode, which is basically do not disturb auto brightness, auto rotation, etc. cetera. Um, which the one plus has a game mode. They have some weird I name mean, most, for it. Yeah. Most yeah, devices yeah. seem to have implemented their own version of game mode. And yeah, yeah. often this is so how my this game mode end up comes on when I'm shopping. On the Nordstrom app, I, well, because every time I go into a shopping app, it goes game mode is on, and I'm like, wow. Your, really? your phone knows that you are a hardcore shopper. <laughs> I know. I yeah. I felt kind of called out when that happened, but yeah, a little bit. Um, and then lastly, uh, a one-handed mode that's being added to the AOSP. Um, so that's a lot of news, a lot of information, but it's always important to note that it is early, folks. It is February, so some, if not much. A lot of this uh, might not even exist in the dev preview builds. It's stuff that they're just working on now. Um, but usually it's a good indicator of what's to come, be it in this version or future versions. Um, so that's a lot. So Sam, yeah, what do you what do you make of all this? Are you now are you what what is your excitement level for Android 12 snow cone now that you're out in this in the snow uh, currently? <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's some, some aspects of it that, that I like, um, you know, something like the app pairs and uh, some of the, the picture in picture stuff looks promising. Uh, I don't know about the, the interface that they've got here. Uh, I'm not sure I'm crazy about, you know, all the rounded rectangles and and stuff. And I mean, for me personally, I, I like a more bold color palette. I'm not crazy about the, the very muted earth tones. But I mean, hopefully I, I've heard that there's supposed to be a theming engine in here. So maybe you'll get to pick your own color palette. Yeah, that's that's my understanding, or at least that's my guess anyways, based on what we've read and based on what we're looking there is is that, um, you know, and they, they even mentioned this in the XDA update, this like a water uh, water paper, wallpaper based theming that what you're looking at in, in that screenshot prior to what we're looking at here, or maybe this also, I'm not really quite sure, um, might be an indication or an example of that, right? Like loading in a wallpaper and then having the interface kind of morph its color palette around that particular wallpaper. Ooh. And so, you know, if they're using a muted Pretty. theme... Uh, or a muted wall wallpaper. Uh, that's what we ended up with. Not necessarily that the OS now all has that color scheme, but that's just one example of it. That's what I hope, because not everybody's yeah. going to dig that. And actually, the the reaction from what I've read, uh, you know, about this, like in places like Reddit and stuff, people have been pretty kind of like, ah, I don't I don't care <laughs> for the look of this and. I don't know if that's the color palette or if that's the kind of rounding of the edges and stuff, because that's maybe a little bit. Uh, well, that's probably part of the theming too. Now that I think about it, if you go in to the the um, yeah the the theme settings, uh, even on Android 11, you have the ability yeah. to kind of adjust some of these things. So mm -hmm. you can adjust the yeah. curvature and the, yeah. and the way it curves. Um, I do think that you pointed out something interesting about whether or not some of the critiques are because they, the, the critic doesn't like the color palette. Right. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's part of the design paradigm we're in now. So it really much aligns with that. And um, in order for the pixel and for Google to really like become this global brand, I mean, it has to keep following the direction of like the UI style, so to speak. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we started to see more of this come out in the desktop operating systems too, coming soon. Mm. One, one thing I hope that they don't change is the, the widgets. I and, mean, you know, we haven't seen anything about the widgets. I, I hope that they retain, you know, the fully interactive style of widgets that we've had all along in, in Android. Cause <clears throat> I've got an iPhone that I keep around for testing purposes and, 
you know, while the the widgets they added in iOS 14 are a step in the right direction, you know, I mean, they're they're just they're pretty static. And I I use a bunch of widgets on my phones, and I like having you know, like I've got one for my calendar agenda for all my meetings. I can scroll through and see you know see very quickly uh, you know what I've got coming up, and I've got got a few others uh, for Google Keep for lists and things like that. And I hope that we that they retain that kind of functionality with the widgets. I feel like widgets have been on a on a like. Wasn't there a period where we thought widgets were going to go away, and then they came? Like, yeah. I, I, I feel like there's been a lot of uh, consternation on the on the on the Android side about what to do with widgets. Right? Yeah. Well, now now that Apple has finally acknowledged that widgets are actually okay, uh -huh. you know, maybe we'll get to keep yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, was it in chat? Uh, Scooter X posted a link in chat to a nine to five Google article, uh, which is titled "Google Bringing Material Design to the Web in a Significant Way with a WordPress Plugin." Mm -hmm. And just looking at the thing, the the posting there, wow! In some ways. And here, I'll see if I can. I don't know if you have access to that. Uh, I, I saw yes in Evian posted something yep. about yeah. that on Twitter. And I, I tried to install that on one of my test sites today and I actually couldn't find the the plugin and um, I didn't have time no, to, I want it. Uh, to download it and upload it manually. Yeah. I want it. But, I'm trying I mean, to decide looking, where I would use it. Looking at it, like it has a lot of similar design notes to some of these screenshots that we're seeing of Android 12. So Those colors are just one particular way to theme it. It's right. So it's so nice and this is really nice. This is very standard, simple web design. There's nothing like shishi or frou frou about it. It's just shishi or frou frou. Shishi or frou frou. <laughs> shishi or frou frou. That's not um, going to be the episode title. Everyone, don't even get. No, that. I don't know how it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'll be curious to see, like. Where I stand on this is that I'm excited that there's a, a visual change coming to Android. Like, right. and I don't, I don't know yet whether I'm going to enjoy it when I'm using it, but I'm just excited for the news that we're getting some sort of major-ish update, which is kind of what this feels like to me, that they're really integrating a new visual direction for Android. Maybe it's not going to end up being that major of a change uh, in use, but just knowing that they aren't just putting out another version with very light, you know, kind of updates and calling it the next version of Android, knowing that there's something more here gets me a little more excited because I, and I think we talked about it last week, but I've just kind of been feeling this kind of like, oh, OK, there, there's that thing again that we've been, you know, spent the last five years looking at. Uh, so it's nice to get a little bit of a fresh take on it now. Well, now, not to be the naysayer before we move on, but mm. it's February. Right. So yeah. do we do we think that typically this cycle, I mean, we're not looking at Android 12 until August, September. Right. So, well, Jason, will, will, will that unless unless they're changing up the schedule, which now anything goes in the time of COVID and all this sort of stuff. But if this is the future of it, Jason, will that excitement sustain another yeah, six months? I see where I see where you're coming yeah. from. Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question. We're probably, I mean, if we know this much already, you're right. We're gonna know a whole lot more as we as we dive in, you know, into the coming months leading up to the release. We still don't. We still aren't even certain how much of this we are gonna see when the dev uh, preview um, launches, which, by the way, we expect to happen sometime in the next month if last year is any indication. So I, th I think the reason that we're seeing all this stuff right now is because this is very near, is because we've got something right around the corner. So I wouldn't be surprised any time in the next coming weeks to wake up to the news that Google announced their next developer, blah, blah, for Android 12. And I then know, we'll I, see I how like much of this actually makes its way in. I like the idea that that also happens like in the middle of the night and you wake up to it like Christmas morning. <laughs> it really feels that way for me. But that's also because like I wake up in the morning and sometimes I don't have the chance to look at my phone for like <laughs> hours. And so when I finally so, do, it's like, all right, what did Google Santa Claus bring to me? <laughs> I have a slight theory that the reason all of this stuff is sort of like here already is because – with the pandemic and not having to be in an office, there have not been perpetual, never-ending meetings. 
Yeah. And so people can actually just like be heads down and working on things. And so for a developer, for somebody who, you know, really is behind behind the platform, like that's good time to just go in and do the deed. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. So I'm excited. Um, in other news flow, this is mm. this is your beat now. Anytime I see a fuchsia topic, I put is your because it starts with an through. F. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. You know what? And I was actually thinking about this. I was like, why? Do, why do I automatically think of you? And I think it's it's purely because you were on stage with Hiroshi Lockheimer yes. and asked him the fuchsia question that a bunch of publications wrote about. So now I just I, I put you in the fuchsia category. I really appreciate you bringing that up. That was um that. <laughs> We could talk about this more offline, but that was yeah. that was pre pre mom flow. Um, anyway, so <laughs> there is there is some news on Fuchsia, which you know we still don't know. Is it going to replace Android? Is it going to replace Chrome OS? Who knows? What is it? But somewhere, some people are having some fun with it. So a new proposal for Fuchsia offers a possible solution for running Linux apps on the OS that use a system called Starnix, spelled S-T-A-R-N-I-X. Now this is not a virtual machine, but a translator between the Linux kernel and Fuchsia's Zircon kernel. Um, that is super fascinating. The proposal repeatedly mentions that this would allow Fuchsia to run Android directly as well, since Android apps have code that's compiled for Linux. So that's interesting. But at the end of the day, we don't know what this is really used for or will, what it will be used for or what it will lead to. But we do know it's a lab project somewhere at the back wing of one of the virtual buildings now, because nobody is in person. And that's where there are folks churning away on, on whatever this this theoretical OS maybe someday. It sounds sounds like Starnix sounds kind of like what uh, Rosetta does on the the new mm. M1 Max, you know, where it, it takes the instructions the first time you run the app and translates it into something that Fuchsia can understand and then just executes it from that. Okay. Um, I wish I wish I knew more about this. To be quite honest, like I never know where to even start reading to really understand things from a Linux point of view, but just the way that this was explained, I can kind of get the gist that this is going to be, it be, it would be a pretty big thing. I just wish I knew what Fuchsia was for. <laughs> I, I, it's I, not for anything right now. It's just I, well, a lab project. Isn't that it's, weird it's, though? It's a, blob it's, it's in a an conversation starter. Basement. Yeah. I guess I guess that's what it is. That's it's purely a conversation starter. It's purely like Google decided You're to do make this like, thing just because. It's, it's an option. It's the other brother in the basement, he gets fed fish heads. Sorry, I just watched that episode of The Simpsons last night, so that's why it's in my head. But that's what Fuchsia is. Okay. All right. So Fuchsia is the, 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 the brother the, in the, the quarter fish head OS. Fish heads. The fish head OS. Okay. I like yeah, that. There it is. Affectionately yeah, has works. ring to it. <laughs> it has a ring to it? I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of these I don't days, Hiroshi we'll Lockheimer would appreciate us calling fuchsia a word that is flamboyant and beautiful, uh, just with a fish head. No offense to fish. <laughs> oh, there it is. Hiroshi See? loves it. See, he's here smiling and, <laughs> and laughing with us. Uh, we'll go ahead and name the title. Name the title of this episode: Fuchsia, the Fish Head OS, and we'll see if he notices. Uh, let's see here. This is interesting stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Hiroshi, for your blessing. Uh, details on Carl Pay's Nothing. So you remember Nothing Oof. is this company that Carl Pay, who is the um, who was with OnePlus forever, he left OnePlus last October, and then soon after founded the company Nothing, <laughs> which is interesting to search for. <sighs> Um, I will I will say because also one of my one of my favorite recent bands is called Nothing as well. <laughs> Oh, and so as same. as trying to find their records and stuff like that, looking for nothing, nothing music yeah. is very hard. So yeah. it's especially it's, with your algorithm. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not that well. So, I mean, actually, that made it easier. But um, oh, fair. the uh, but the but yeah, you naming your company nothing is is worse than essential. Yes, right. Well, they're in bed together. We'll talk about that in a second. Nothing is apparently a thing. Nothing is a thing. That's that's what's going on. Here. 
Uh, Google Ventures has now backed the company with $15 million of Series A funding. So Google slash Alphabet is in on nothing's success. Along with that announcement, Pay also confirmed that the company's first true wireless earbuds are going to launch this summer. So mm. they're kind of leaning with an early focus on audio, but again, reiterating that they plan mm. to expand into an ecosystem of devices. So it's not Very like they're a headphone show company. Me. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, actually. That's a good comparison. Um, yeah. But also this, yesterday, 9to5, Google published its findings that Essentials' Andy Rubin apparently signed over the Essential brand to nothing. This deal completed January 6, 2021, so last month, <clears throat> which, Jeez. I mean, I don't know how you interpret that. Does that it signal the, enter, the entrance or the, the intent to enter the smartphone market at some point uh, using Essentials' patents? I, this could go in a number of different directions. Uh, Sam, I'm really curious to hear your take on what this might mean for nothing. What does all of this uh, ado about nothing? I, I think they're finally <laughs> going to bring out the, the essential smart home hub. <laughs> ah, okay. That could be, right? I mean, uh, a did, home ecosystem. Do, do we know, did, did they get any IP from essential or just the brand? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. I don't know based on Why what I... Why would you I, want the... Why would you want the brand? It has to be IP, right? <laughs> has to be. I mean, what right, value does the brand that is tainted? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, because right, so. there's no value in a tainted brand that is tainted yeah. by Andy Rubin. So. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm doing kind of some search. Um, yeah, I mean, even nine to five Google, who wrote about this, you know, they're they're just speculating that it has something to do with the patent catalog. Um, but I don't know that we know the details of that yet. There's nothing to be found there. See, every time we talk about them, we can just say nothing. I just nothing feel bad for all the developers and the people who, like, it's hard, man. It's hard out here working for these companies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got essential folding into nothing. You've got some of the... <laughs> I'm sorry, I the, keep laughing at that phrase. <laughs> hey, maybe they're going to bring out a folding essential phone under the nothing brand. <laughs> the, essentially nothing. It essentially there you go. perfect. Oh, there you go. There we or go. Or as Alex Kranz tweeted, nothing is. central, which I thought was very clever. <laughs> essentially nothing. I like that too. Man, we've got lots of I, great I don't ideas. want to bag on the brand before it's like done anything on and I'm talking specifically about the brand nothing. Um but it's, you know, it, it's the name. The name is Yeah. It's it's, it's hard it's to not name. want to go go in the direction of a joke when the, when the name of the company is not company. Listen, I know my name is Florence. Okay, people call me Flo. Do you know how <laughs> like people just love to when they say Aunt Flo to me? Oh, oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can understand that. Going to get angry. <sighs> yeah. Um, all right. So we've got a whole lot more to talk about uh, up next. But first, let's take a moment and thank the sponsor of All About Android. And this episode is brought to you by SanDisk, which is awesome. I've used SanDisk disk products uh, for a long, long time. Backing up, transferring files, especially when you're doing it on your phone, can be a real pain in the butt. Uh, but it's even worse to get the out-of-storage uh, message. Now, thanks to SanDisk, managing your data storage is easy. They're ultra dual drive Lux, which is this tiny little thing. I mean, it's a tiny thumb drive. It's a two-in-one reversible so uh, flash drive. So it has USB type C on one end. It has uh, the traditional type A connector on the other end, which is, I mean, it's super handy in my use because uh, because I, it doesn't matter what device I'm using or what port it has, it works. It makes it simple to back up and share your files to any of your devices. Uh, with the Ultra Dual Drive Lux, all you have to do is plug in the drive and then once you plug it in, you start freeing up your space. You can choose from 32 gigs all the way up to one terabyte of storage on one of these tiny things. Uh, easily, you can transfer your data. Portability, you know, is this is all about portability, so you can move it from one device to another. Uh, and automatically keep a backup copy on the drive. And you can free up valuable space, so you can make the most of your phone's capabilities. Now, 
Here's what I really love about this. First, having both of those connectors means that I don't have to search for a dongle just to plug the drive into my laptop, right? I have a MacBook Pro that only has USB-C port. So if I want to take any of my thumb drives and plug it in there and use it, I need to find my dongle. Where is it right now? I don't even know. See, if I wanted to do it right now, I couldn't because it's not around here. Uh, but this has the USB-C uh the USB-C capability on here, as well as USB-A. So yes, I can plug it into my computer. I can plug it into my phone. I can plug it into my Commodore 64, <laughs> which I did say that right, the, the C64 that I mentioned on the show a few weeks back. It has a USB-A, a bunch of USB-A ports. So I can use, if I'm if I'm taking a, a like a game ROM uh, that I have on my laptop and I want to bring it over to the, the Commodore 64, I just use the USB-C in my MacBook Pro, put the files on there, flip it over to USB-A, pop that in the C64, and everything's there. And uh, and I mean, and that's all you know on top of the fact that this can so easily integrate and interface with my smartphone. You know, I plug it into my smartphone, I plug it into my uh, my Pixel 4 XL, and immediately in the file manager, I see the drive there. It's easy to move files over onto it, uh, and I can back up. It's really all about flexibility. That's the the main key benefit of the Ultra Dual Drive Lux. So, you know, don't don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. It's a two-in-one drive from SanDisk. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order of featured SanDisk products, but only when you go to sandisk.com slash AAA. That's S-A-N-D-I-S-K dot com slash AAA. And check them out for yourself. Take a look at all their products. Definitely take a look at the Ultra Dual Drive Lux. Such a cool uh, little flash drive. And it even has a little kind of a loop on it so I can keep it on my key ring. If I ever start leaving the house, that'll become really important. So sandus.com slash AAA. And we thank them for their support. All right. That's cool hardware. But let's talk about more cool hardware right now. Well, 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 we were just talking about Xiaomi, weren't we? Uh, And now Xiaomi's got a big leak on YouTube, although it has since been removed. But that leak showed an unannounced Mi 11 Ultra with a very unique camera bump. Perhaps something that we'll see, oh, coming soon. For those watching the video feed right now, you're looking at what might be the next very informational camera bump. So not only is the camera bump massive, it houses a triple camera array and a tiny secondary display. So the cameras include a 50 megapixel main, a 48 megapixel wide angle, a 48, excuse me, a 48 megapixel wide angle, a 48 megapixel periscope telephoto zoom with up to 120 X zoom. This phone will also feature 67 watt wireless charging and a couple other specs that were mentioned along with this leak was a 6.8 inch quad curved OLED running at 120 hertz refresh rate along with a Snapdragon 888 and an IP68 rating. Um, So of course, as we see things that get really big hype overseas, sometimes tend to find its way over here. I don't know. Sam, what do you think about having a display on the back of a camera? Um, That's a huge camera bump. It's really Mm -hmm. thick. Yeah, it Uh, is. I can see where that that could actually be interesting, you know, if you can, you know, if you wanted to use the good camera on the back as your selfie cam, you could Mm -hmm. actually see yourself or, you know, if you're taking pictures of somebody and they wanted to be able to see what you're seeing, you know, if they're posing, um, you know, they could get a little preview of themselves, you know, of of how they look, Um, you know, so that could see some uses for it. Uh, do we know, is it a touch screen or is it just a display? I think it's just I don't know a that we know display. That. Yeah, I don't yeah. know that we know that so, yet based on this leak. I mean, you know, if it's just mirroring what's on the main screen, you know, th- there are some potential uses for it, but that's a really thick camera pump. 
Yeah, it is. I think it's a mirror, actually, because looking at it, it's uh, the so for those listening to the audio feed, what we're basically looking at is this this panel. It looks like let's say it looks like a widget the way it'd be laid out. So we have like two camera lenses right, smushed right next to each other. And then underneath it, we've got, I guess, another camera lens plus like fancy text. We have a flash to the right of that. And then we have this very thin, small screen that just shows the it just shows the home screen because I I see the home screen. I see the apps that would be on the home screen. I see a Google search bar. I see a time. So it probably is. Sam is right for taking a gorgeous 50 megapixel selfie. And I mean, you know, looking at the size of the the cameras on there, the lenses, you know, those are some big lenses. So maybe maybe this thing's got really large um, image sensors. Yeah. And I mean, this this could actually be a really some really impressive hardware. Now, of course, you know, it depends on how good Xiaomi's software is, but but this could be some really impressive optical hardware on this uh, on this phone. Yeah, with that extra depth. I was trying to show it off, but but pretty poorly uh, uh, able to. The uh, Galaxy Note S, uh, the Note 20 5G, and just the deep kind of camera bump, which I'm having a hard that's time so getting big. my camera to really focus that's on it. So but. that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, Look, but I know you people know, use pop sockets these days and things like that. But gosh, that's such a big bump. Um, and I, I mean. It is, but at the same time, if, you know, if camera is truly the, you know, if you are a user who thinks that the camera is one of the most important functions of their phone, maybe it's worth it. I mean, at least well, I could say the, on on the, uh, the note that I have here, yes, it's a large camera bump, but then you take like this insidi- Incipio case, which I would put on anyway, so that it, you know, when I inevitably drop it, I, it won't destroy it. Right, and they and made that, it to give it some drop protection with the little buffer. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and then and then it kind of disappears. Which I mean, obviously, a lot of people are going to say, "Well, I don't want to have to put a case on on my phone to like make the design better." But I mean, if if a camera is really important to you, like this is one way to do it, and then you don't well, really. Well, there's notice, a lot of you know, it's just there's a lot of self-professed uh, uh, fo- camera phone people. Like there's a whole photography segment yeah. that just exists using phones, and so if you fall within that audience, of course this is gonna this is this is gonna be attractive to you. You know, yeah. if you're a casual person who has a phone and you like the fact that it has a camera because you can snap pictures, it's probably overkill. But if you are in camera digital photography land, this yeah, is on absolutely. your radar. So. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah, I mean maybe maybe Xiaomi is trying to compete with that new twenty five hundred dollars Sony phone that was just released. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they need to make it an, um, an external display that takes HDMI input then. Well, Did it's got the really external display see. built right in. Did anyone write in, by the way, Jason? <laughs> do we have any people do we have any people who actually are interested in that phone? Didn't we put that call out? Oh yeah, no, I haven't. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. We haven't gotten an email from anyone so that says they are interested. I will <laughs> give I will give points to the rugged phone people, not to the crazy video creator people. So there you go. Yeah. Not that they're yeah, crazy. Fair enough. Know. Anyway, um, moving on. I feel like I'm stealing from Flo's beat by talking about wearables here. But uh, but the information had a report that Facebook is building a smartwatch on Android. Flo, are you excited for a Facebook smartwatch? Um, uh, it- no, I'm just the Facebook phone is what the headline for this ours article is like after the failure of Facebook phone. Now that I want to, like, I want to get to that because I don't think that's fair. But let, let's get through the data, then I'll, I'll go right. back to that. So it says, so uh, this this smartwatch will accept a SIM, um, and it's and it basically sounds like Facebook wants to build its own smartwatch ecosystem that leans heavily on Facebook. It will have fitness features. No indication that it will use Wear OS, um, but the report does say it will quote unquote run on an open source version of Google's Android software, and Wear OS is not open source. So you have to imagine that maybe it's it's you know it's uh, a built on top of AOSP, um, more likely a fork of of the phone Android building Facebook's own smartwatch OS on top of it. And the the incendiary Ars Technica article that we're referring to said after the failure of the Facebook phone, get ready for a Facebook watch. And 
I agree. Facebook has had not one but two attempts at phones, right? They 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 had they they were they were putting the little Facebook button so on phones the, at one point. It, was it the and, HTC Cha Cha? Yeah, the yes, Cha Cha. The Cha Cha. Oh, yeah. that's the phone. Okay. But I was thinking as, about the uh, the other HTC phone that came first? out. Yes, I can't remember. There's the other one. Yeah. But as far as I could tell, the Facebook portal, people are buying those. Like oh, they I are. see commercials they for are. those. Yeah, like so Facebook isn't completely a hardware failure. So, like, not that I'm defending Facebook here, but they have a piece of hardware that is in market and that is being iterated on and people are using it. So why why couldn't they go out into smartphone into smart watches? I don't know, you know, so well, you know, here's the thing. Uh, the, the real context behind this to take into consideration is how poorly Wear OS has performed overall in the entire marketplace of smartwatches yeah. and how yeah. we're here discussing the viability of a Facebook watch and how like, yeah, it's possible that could happen because the market share is all over and there are a couple like big players Apple being the biggest one um, for anybody who's watching the video feed. It is a little over 50% for the Apple Watch, and it makes sense. It's a freaking great product, um, followed by a lot of a uh, couple others like Garmin, Samsung, Huawei, I think overseas is doing really well. So there's an opportunity. If they can, if they can make the portal work, because the whole Facebook integration, uh, I wonder if there would be some like family plugin or something. So, you know, I'm thinking in terms of that. Um, yeah. Do you Google really want Facebook <laughs> tracking your, your fitness information, your, you know, your heart, heart rate and uh, things like I that. I mean, is it, is it worse, is it worse than your location and who you talk to and your phone number and who you call and your messages? <laughs> I mean, at Facebook that point, knows all that already. That's yeah, the thing. At that if point, you're in that. Uh, if, if if you're in the ecosystem, you're in the ecosystem. So exactly. might as well throw That's in some true. fitness data at this at, while you're on it. <laughs> I mean, I to yeah. to add to that, I'm in with Google. I mean, I, Google I was just gonna say Google knows. Yeah, Google for me. Google knows my weight fluctuations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why why wouldn't Google my knows how I sleep? Huh. Yeah. Jason's on the fence. You, mm -hmm. well, Jason, why do you, why? Okay, so Sam and Jason, why do you trust Google more than Facebook? Because mm -hmm. uh, they're not Facebook. <laughs> it's not, they're not led by Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't I mean, have I a much better fit. answer than that either. I mean, it, I, I totally understand the kind of the hip, the hypocritical statement or position to be in, where I trust one company with all of my data and I don't trust the other. But um, there have been a number of examples that Facebook has just kind of given me reason to not trust them. And I, and, but I mean, but I also realize like Google's given us examples as well. And yet I seem to give them a pass. So I don't really have a good answer for this. All I know is that Google's I don't trust slightly Facebook lesser and evil. I trust Google more. <laughs> they're, slightly they're slightly lesser, lesser evil. evil. Yeah. 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 Not, not quite as evil. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And then and then the idea of using the Android phone OS for a wearable, like I'm just, I don't know, something about that gives me uh, gives me a reason to worry a little bit as far as like how good it will be when it's done. But won't know until it's done, I suppose. I don't put it past Facebook for for trying, you know. Um, as Ron Amadio pointed out in the article, the the one hardware thing that Facebook has has been able to really pull off has been their acquisition of Oculus. Yeah. And, you know, and like that hardware is great, except, you know, then they go in after the fact and do their whole data thing, their data claim on it. And that, you know, pissed a bunch of people off. So but it's it's just the Facebook way. It's just how it goes over there. So I'm not surprised. I mean, but that's just how it goes in Silicon Valley. We can't say yeah. that Facebook yeah. is any worse off, totally. you know, than Google requiring a login somewhere so you can use something. Um, because it's just, you didn't sign the contract with Facebook to be the product. Or when you did, you got tired of it by leaving Facebook. And with Google, that contract is still viable. That's really yeah. what it is at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. So. Yep. Um, and uh, points to you, Sam, for remembering both HTC First and HTC Cha Cha. 
I hadn't remembered those names in I quite a while. I reviewed the those... HTC first. That was actually really nice hardware, just FYI. Was it? Well, that, that was it, in it was. HTC's glory days. But that's because right? it's HTC. And anyway, that's another story yeah. for another day. We already went down the nostalgia hole earlier today. So, <laughs> All about Android yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> all about android old news old news uh all right and uh real quick we have one piece of app news to talk about okay. people getting all sorts of PO'd about this one. Uh, LastPass made a very controversial announcement today. They announced that the free tier of their password manager will soon require users to choose either mobile phone, like mobile devices as a kind of like a blanket category for it to run on or computers. So in other words, if you are, if you use a computer and you use your smartphone and you want LastPass to manage all of your passwords, log you in on both of those devices, you're out of luck unless you're paying for their premium tier. The premium tier costs $3 a month. Family tier costs $4 a month. Uh, here in this household, we are premium, you know, full disclosure, like I, I use LastPass. I love it. Um, I use the premium tier. So arguably this doesn't affect me, but uh, like directly. And and also the LastPass was a sponsor for a long time. They are no longer a sponsor now, um, just as that disclosure as well. But it's interesting to me from the perspective of like practicing safe internet is something that we've all had to learn how to do. And I think there's probably a lot of people who have introduced a solution like LastPass to, let's just say like, you know, me introducing LastPass to my parents, finally get them practicing safe passwords with, uh, with a LastPass solution mm. only to now suddenly be faced with, uh, okay, now we kind of have to change things. I get it from the business perspective as a user, it just kind of sucks. What do you guys think? Uh, I think, you know, this is something that we're just, all going to have to get used to is for yeah. paying for stuff. Um, yeah, and, yeah, fair enough. I, it, I mean, it, co it costs money to maintain these, you know, to run the servers, to, you know, keep updating the software. And, you know, if you get value out of it, maybe we should be paying for it. I'd, I'd rather pay. I mean, I've been paying for LastPass Premium for a better part of a decade. So I would just as soon continue paying for that, you know, rather than having ads inserted into it. Mm. Sure. Yeah, and, and it's fu it's funny. I mean, Sam, I echo you exactly. We've we, and we talked about this in the past, but we've in the past ten plus years have cultivated a uh, environment of I don't want to say entitlement or, or or but there's an expectation to not have to pay for stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like like the yep. the marketplace has gotten so bad, and I'm I've I've dealt with this uh, directly on my own for you know for my company for uh, my startup Scorbit. Um, which is building a basically a platform as a service company. You know, we offer our software for uh, at a subscription uh, for three ninety nine a month or forty bucks a year. You get access to the platform, and it discounts if you buy more. And I, I'm not trying to turn this to an ad, but I'm just saying that like we we've tried to do it in a way that allows us to remain solvent, but we still need to get paid in order to keep everything on. And that's been the biggest detractor, the biggest complaint we've gotten from customers is like, well, I don't want to pay four bucks a month. And I'm like, yeah, but you, you're going to go drop $20 at the arcade on pinball. Like what is four bucks a month to you? Right? Yeah. Like, so it's, it's, it's fascinating when people hear monthly subscription costs, what the visceral, visceral reaction is. And, you know, and I understand it because there's a lot of stuff I don't want to pay for that stuff like last pass that I do pay for. Um, but I think that there's a, the majority of people feel an expectation that this stuff should just be free. So it's, it's a byproduct of the strange world we live in now. Yeah. Part, part majority of people also, I think just cause everything is just money all the time, constantly you just, you got to throw money at everything all, all the time. And so not, not with regards to score, but, but just with regards to something like last pass, um, I think what really sucks <laughs> for lack of better terminology is when you really get into an app or an ecosystem or you really, you know, come to rely on something over the years and then it just kind of changes the routine on you. And that's always right. kind of a bummer. 
But yeah, the thing, I mean, but the thing is, is that it's not like they're doing it maliciously. Like I'm sure that yeah. they've they they yeah. wrung their hands on this a lot, and nobody want because you know they're going to get this backlash. But like, yeah, do do you like do you like it? Do you want to keep using it? Do you see where the story is going? Right? Like that's kind do of. Do you what want happens. it to go away, or do you want to yeah, keep, exactly. do you want to have it available? Yeah. 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 I mean that that is yeah ultimately that is the point right like if 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 let's say you have been using this for a good part of a decade uh, as a free user and you've gotten obviously you've gotten value out of it as a free user um maybe that's the indication that it is good enough to pay for you know especially when you're talking like 3 or 4 dollars a month I can also understand the the idea you know people push back on this idea that like uh, never, never, you know, before now, was there any indication that this free service would suddenly turn paid? So I had no expectation of this to happen. But maybe that's the point is that maybe when something is free, we should always enter into it, understanding that at some point that free contract might turn into a paid contract because these are businesses. They need to um, they need to do what they need to do to stay in business. And free doesn't last forever. Like maybe there are some examples of that, but there are a lot of examples of not that. And, uh, you know, time and time. I mean, Google Photos is another example of that. We just talked about that a couple of months ago. This just happens. Yep. Part of how it all rolls, I suppose. Part of um, how I, it all rolls. How yeah, the a lot of people crumbles. I'm hearing about uh, Bitwarden as a uh, kind of alternatives that people are turning to. So you have alternatives yeah. if you really want to, you know, uh, end up going away from LastPass. Totally fine and totally possible. I think you can export your data out of there and import it into a solution like Bitwarden, and uh, you'll be a, you'll be fine. So you've got options. Yeah. Not the end of the world. There's, there's always options. There's always something else. There's there are things you can spin up yourself. There's like yeah, it's just a matter of how deep you want to go to it. I for one. Yeah. If I find value for it, I I don't mind yeah. paying for it. But you know, but I recognize that trying times and not every you know some stuff is a luxury and that sort of thing. But um, yeah. But speaking of money, this is probably a good time to pause and thank our next sponsor. <laughs> Let's why do not? it. Uh, this episode of All About Android is brought to you by IT Pro TV. The tech industry is rapidly expanding, and the demand for IT skills in the workplace workplace is growing as well. An IT career can be rewarding and have longevity, which is something we can all use in our working lives, that's for sure. They don't just teach you IT skills. They teach you the skills that are in demand. You want to be valuable to your future employers, and you will with IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV tells you what those jobs are and how to get certified for them. One of the best things about IT Pro TV is their wonderful teaching style. They have seven studios where they teach you the ins and outs of IT that's entertaining and fun. One reviewer said, this site has helped me with two certifications and also as the supplemental material for my grad school classes. Give it a try, you won't be disappointed. Get the certifications you need from the safety and comfort of your own home. You'll be able to learn at your own pace and schedule. And with over 5,800 hours of IT training available to stream, you'll find the right content that fits your educational goals. And listen, I'm a project manager at heart. That's what I started in this biz as. And that's why I'm so excited to hear that February is Project Management Month at IT Pro TV. They'll have a webinar live on February 11th and on demand thereafter, considering that this is after February 11th. You can go watch it on demand. And it's called Navigating the Future of Project Management. They have courses in PMP, ITIL, uh, service, <laughs> service Management, and Agile. You can get training in Microsoft, Cisco, Apple, Linux, and more. They're the only official video training partner for CompTIA. You can get one of their learning coaches along with all their wonderful job resources to help guide you on your career path. You'll always be supported with IT Pro TV's amazing team. For more insight about IT, check out their podcast, Technado. Um, and that's with Don Pazette, featuring industry guests and IT news recaps for a deeper dive into the IT realm. So listen, you want to get a new career in IT with the best IT education around? Go to itpro.tv slash allaboutandroid and use code AAA30 to receive 30% off all consumer subscriptions. That's itpro.tv slash allaboutandroid and use code AAA30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. And to all of you up and coming project managers, I salute you. It's a great way. It's a great career to get into. I took some PMP classes. I wish I had IT Pro TV back when I uh, took PMP classes. I probably would have finished the certification. Uh, but thank you, IT Pro TV. Uh, you're awesome. We appreciate you. 
Thank you. They are awesome. IT Pro TV. All right. So the main event. <laughs> Uh, we'll talk with you, Sam, a little bit about Android Auto and Android Automotive, which I imagine are commonly compared and misunderstood between mm -hmm. the two. I know including that by I us. have. Yeah, <laughs> including by us. So why don't we start with kind of the basics here? Because that was kind of the crux of the email that we got from you initially. Uh, compare in like from your pr perspective and you've had. I mean, we've all had experience with Android Auto. You've had experience with Android Automotive and really understanding like what it actually means when a car has Android Automotive integrated throughout. So compare a little bit what you what you understand from your experience of Android Auto to Android Automotive. Yeah, so let's start with Android Auto. First thing to know about Android Auto is it's not an operating system. You know, back I don't know what, mm. five, six, seven years ago when they first started talking about Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, people thought about, oh, yeah, I can run iOS or I can run Android in my car. And that's not mm. exactly what's happening. You know, every car has got different user interfaces, different hardware interfaces. Some have touchscreens, some have central control knobs like BMW iDrive. You know, some have gesture controls. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff out there. And what both Android Auto and CarPlay do is they act like driver layers to translate the controls that you are doing in the car, whatever whatever physical controls are in the car, to a common signal that the phone can understand. And then it the phone projects uh, the information from whatever app you're running onto the, the vehicle screen. Uh, in a in a common interface, you know, so they've got a common set of templates. There's one template for media apps. There's another one for maps, and and so on. Uh, and so it's just acting as a as an interface layer between your phone and the car. And the stuff is all the all the important all the apps and everything are actually running on your phone. Android Automotive, and you know, to what we were talking about earlier with branding with nothing, Android Auto and Android Automotive. Google's really needs to do something about their branding with those two because they, you know, yeah. it's ridiculously confusing. Android Automotive is actually a full operating system, so that's the operating system that powers your infotainment system in the car. And actually, this is not the first time that car companies have used Android for infotainment systems. My wife's 2017 Honda Civic, the infotainment system in that is actually running on uh, Android 4.2. It's running AOSP. Um, with a, a different uh, skin on it. And a number of manufacturers, including Honda, have used various versions of the AOSP code, but that was never designed specifically for automotive applications, and it's kind of limited in the car. Um, so and what Google did with Android Automotive was they took Android and they customized it for automotive applications. So it can be that full operating system so that you can actually run all the Android apps, just like you know, you run, you can run Android apps on a Chromecast, on the new Chromecast, or on an Android TV device. Now you can do it in your car if you have Android Automotive, and also if you have Google Automotive services. So this is where that you have the analog to the the phones, to the mobile devices. Um, you know, on phones, phone makers can use. Android, the open source Android operating system. But if they want the Google apps, they have to license Google mobile services that gets you the Play Store and Play services and and access to all the, the apps in the Play Store. Uh, and also the, the Google closed source apps like Gmail and Calendar and, and Keep and so on. For automotive, there's a similar suite called Google Automotive Services that automakers can either choose to license or not. And most are incorporating Google Automotive services with their Android Automotive applications, but not not everybody. So um, the first company to come out with a Google Automotive system was Volvo and its its Polestar division for the Polestar 2 uh, electric car that came out last year, and also their uh, X, Volvo XC40 uh, electric version. Uh, they have a new infotainment system that's running Android Automotive, and it has a custom Volvo 
skin on it, just like Samsung would do their own skin on their own launcher on their phones. Um, so they've got that and they're running Google automotive services. So you get the Google assistant, you get Google calendar and apps and, and all the other, um, uh, app, all the other Google apps that you can run directly in the car and the play store. Fiat Chrysler recently launched their Uconnect 5 system on the, the new um, Chrysler Pacifica minivan. And they have Android Automotive, but they're not using the Google Automotive services. They instead chose to use um, the uh, Amazon voice services. I'm not going to say uh, Madam A's name, um, but they've got, they've got that as their their voice assistant, along with TomTom Tom for apps and uh, a couple of other uh, things, some other stuff that they've got in there. And they've got their own marketplace for apps that where you can download um, apps specific, you know, they're Android apps, uh, but you're downloading them from a, um, from a, a Chrysler uh, app store instead of from the Google Play Store. So that's kind of the, the high level view of the two. I love it. Um, you're, you're the, the, perfect person to talk about all this stuff and really kind of pick this apart. So know, in your so experience, good. when you are in a vehicle that has a layer of Android automotive running inside of it, is there any indication that you can perceive that this is like an Android layer or is that skinning just totally removing any of that Android personality, replacing it with the personality that the, the vehicle maker uh, chooses and you wouldn't know the difference. It's, it's more the latter, you know, I mean, it doesn't look like a Google pixel launcher or anything like that. Right. You know, it's a, it's a custom interface. Um, you know, it has, you know, you go from one to another, they have similar functionality. You know, you, you know, you'll have a, uh, a, a button for Google, you know, for maps, you'll have one for, you know, the, for the, whatever voice assistant they choose to implement, uh, things like that. Uh, and for, you know, for this, whatever store they use. So if they're, you know, in the case of Volvo and uh, in a couple of years, Ford's going to have their own um, and GM's launching one later this year. Um, you know, there there's a link directly to the Google Play Store um, with, um, you know, with the Chrysler system. It goes to Chrysler's uh, app store. Uh, you know, so Chrysler kind of went the, the direction that um, – that uh, Amazon did with their Fire OS on their tablets, uh, you know, where they've got their own skin. But, you know, everybody's doing their their own custom skin on it. There is no, as far as I can tell, there is no stock skin for Android Automotive. I'm sure there probably is a stock launcher somewhere, mm -hmm. but no automaker is actually using that. So if I'm in the market for a car... <laughs> it was just such a loaded question, a loaded thing to say. But let's assume that I can I can generally afford, you know, not we're not talking anything north of 50 grand, but like somewhere between 20 and 50 grand, right? That that range of cars. And I'm an Android super fan. And, mm -hmm. you know, is there am I looking more towards a Chrysler or something like that that's running Android Automotive? Or would you recommend I look at a car that has support for Android Auto? Like which gives the more Android pure uh, experience for me? Um, well, pretty much almost everything now. There's only a couple of brands that are not supporting Android Auto at this point. Uh, Porsche is one of them. And actually they are bringing Android Auto to their vehicles. Um, but, uh, you know, almost everybody's supporting both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And even if you have Android Automotive, the, all the Android Automotive systems are also supporting CarPlay. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you want to plug in your phone or, or use it wirelessly, actually, you can, you can do, you, they support wireless CarPlay and wireless Android Auto. You can do that. And, you know, if you really like the Android Auto interface and you want to run the apps from your phone instead of running them directly in the head unit, you can do that. Um, you know, it's, I think the, the, the big advantage to Android automotive, uh, especially for, for the brands that choose to use the Google automotive services is you'll have access to the play store and Google assistant in there, you know, in terms of the look and feel it's, you know, you're, it, there's nothing really that's distinctively Android about it. Um, but you will be able to run those apps directly on there. So you don't have, you don't even have to connect your phone. You can, you can download the apps directly, you know, cause all these, all these vehicles have their own 
cellular modems built in that are on LTE modems, and they they'll just da- you just download the apps directly and run it on that screen, and st- and you don't even have to use your phone at all. You can leave your phone in your pocket or purse or wherever, and never touch it, and, and it's not using that connection at all. For the Android manufacturers, too oh, sorry, go the phone. I was just going to say Android Auto is just sounds like the biggest difference is it's very reliant on the phone. Yeah, it's totally reliant on the phone. Android Auto um, and CarPlay won't do anything unless your phone is connected to the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the apps are running directly on your – they're running on your phone and just projecting the output to the screen of your car. So um, without without a phone, they won't do anything. I mean, they, they'll run the they'll run the stock infotainment system, but it won't run any of your media apps. Um, you know, whereas you know on uh, on on Android Automotive, you know, you can download YouTube Music or Spotify or um, you know Amazon Music or what you know whatever your preference is, and run them directly in the car without without using the phone. So when a, when a manufacturer explicitly, like like Ford just announced uh, not very long ago, when they explicitly say and announce all of our vehicles are going to be running on Android Automotive, you know, in a couple of years, taking Ford as the example, what are they what are they choosing it for exactly? Like, why are they choosing Android Automotive over another solution? Is it ease of implementation of creating that layer? Is it that hey, we've been do- doing this on our own, and it turns out this is actually better? It, what what kinds of benefits are they actually getting out of of choosing Android Automotive over the others? So in the case of Ford, uh, and actually a lot of other automakers today, most of these infotainment systems are actually running either Linux or QNX underneath as the base right. operating system. Um, and was that Leo's car? Yeah, I was just going to say he picked it up this afternoon <laughs> after security. Oh, now he? he says he got it because of you. By the way, okay. he said you oh. made him get it. So. So right right now, that's got QNX as the base operating system, and then there's Ford's interface layer there that's called Sync. So you know, and Ford, they, Ford calls their brands theirs as Sync, uh, yeah. Sync Four in the in yeah. the uh, uh, the Mach E, and um, you know, just like you don't see the um, the QNX, you never see the QNX layer. It's just there underneath, you know, the underlying you know the interfaces to the hardware. The um, the advantage when they switch over from QNX to Android Automotive is they will have access to those Google Automotive services, so the the Play Store, uh, Google Maps, um, and you know they'll also you know they'll get support from Google um, for helping to develop this stuff. So there will still be a Ford interface, a Ford Sync interface, which my guess is it probably won't actually look a whole lot different from what's in there today. But um, the, it will, um, you know, it will be able to run. You know, you'll have the option to run these Android apps. You know, to open up the the Play Store, download Android apps, and run those. So that's something you can't do today. If uh, if Ford wants to have app support today on their on their systems, they have to convince developers to build apps specifically to run on QNX mm-hmm. on their system. And, you know, you know, you know, yeah. you talk, you know, many times over the years of how hard it is to get apps to, or to get developers to come to a new platform. Um, and, you know, because every automaker's, you know, got different platforms today, they'll, you know, if they're, um, if they're all running Android automotive, then they'll all have access to the full library of Android apps. Um, and, you know, if someday Apple wants to do, uh, you know, an OS, you know, to run in cars and license that to automakers, then, you know, they could potentially run iOS apps directly on their uh, on their systems, uh, something they can't do today. I thought, man, I thought this was all supposed to be taken care of with the introduction of like Android Auto and CarPlay. Like I've been hearing about QNX for a long time and I thought that all of this is supposed to unify all of us. <laughs> well, it, it does to a degree. Um, you know, with um, you know, with Android Auto, you know, you you have an it provides an interface, you know, so that you can use the apps on your phone. Um, but it's Android Auto has always been fairly limited in what apps 
you or what kinds of apps you have access to. You have maps and you know today you only have um, Google Maps and Waze uh, availability on there. I think there's some others that may be coming soon. Um, you know, and then you have your media apps and your messaging apps. And that's basically all you can run in Android Auto. That's all that Google's ever allowed. Um, right. With Android Automotive, they're they're going to open that up a little bit. So there's going to be a little more flexibility in the kinds of apps that can run. You know, one of the things that, the, you know, that they might be able to do, um, and I, I think, you know, part of this is going to depend on the, the automakers, is, um, you know, allow for games to run on there. You know, like today, if you have a mm. Tesla, you know, Tesla, you know, has a bunch of games, you know, you got asteroids and, and some other stuff that, that you can run on your Tesla screen. Heavy set. Um, in the future, you might be able to download, you know, Real Racing 3 onto your car and, you know, pretend cool. you're racing while you're sitting in your car parked, you know, while your car is parked. Uh, you know, or, you know, play um, Fortnite or, or something else, you know, uh, you know, just download the Android app and run that on your uh, on your screen in the car. I, I think the most important uh, follow up on that is will will manufacturers be able to copy Tesla and allow for the sound of farts to go off every time you put on your blinker? No. Oh, no, please. Um, I think that that is explicitly prohibited by um, <laughs> National Highway Traffic Safety yeah, Administration say- regulations. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> if it's not, it should be. That's, that should, should be the be. first thing that Pete Buttigieg does is is uh, institute a new federal motor vehicle safety standard that bans fart apps in cars. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Uh, Sam, this is all like really great. Um, I am... So I guess just kind of like round off our conversation, we kind of touched upon it a little earlier, but, you know, if you had any advice for any of our listeners or uh, viewers about if they're going out to look for a car, whether new or used, um, and they were interested in, and this was a criteria for them that really mattered, what, what would you suggest to them? What would you leave them with? I, I would say uh, as a bare minimum, you know, for if you're going out shopping for a car today, you know, make sure that, you know, uh, especially if it's a used car, you know, if it's relatively new you know, in the last three or four years, uh, you'll almost certainly have both Android Auto and CarPlay support in there. You know, just make sure that that's in there. Um, ideally, you know, if, if you're getting a new car, a lot of the 2020, 2021, 2022 models that are coming soon um, have wireless Android auto support. Um, and, you know, that's that's, a, uh, you know, another step forward because now you don't have to futz around with the USB cable. And, you know, most of those vehicles also have a wireless charging pad. So if you've got a phone with wireless charging, um, you know, take advantage of that if it's if it's available. Um and, uh, you know, then, you know, as, as you're shopping for new cars right now, it's still relatively limited the, the number of vehicles that have Android automotive support. Uh, but, you know, going forward over the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot more vehicles that have that capability. And, um, you know, take, I think the, the main thing is whatever you're, whatever you're looking at, make sure you take it for a test drive, um, connect your phone to it, you know, Pair it up, you know, see how hard, see how challenging it is to pair with Bluetooth. Take a, take a USB cable with you yep. um, when you go, when you go car shopping and, you know, plug in your phone and make sure it works, you know, see, see how, you know, and play around with the infotainment system, um, you know, as well, you know, while you're, while you're driving the car, make sure that the interface is something that works smoothly and that feels intuitive. You know, if, if you're, getting lost in it or you can't find basic functions like, you know, how to, uh, how to enter, um, you know, a, a destination for navigation or things like that, um, then might want to avoid that vehicle, uh, unless there's something else really compelling about it that you really want. Um, because the infotainment system is, you know, one of the things that you use the most often, you know, in addition to driving. And yeah. you want to make sure you have something that yep. you're comfortable with and, um, you know, make sure that the screen is, is, you know, visible. Um, if you, like me, I wear polarized sunglasses when it's sunny out sure. and screens, in, there are some particular vehicles, some particular brands where the screens just totally fade out, 
yeah. or get look all distorted through polarized sunglasses. So, you know, check out those yes. sorts of things. Put on your sunglasses. Make sure you can see it. Um, yes. <laughs> and I guess one one other thing that I didn't really mention um, that I didn't get into very much is the voice assistant stuff. With um, When you do get Android Automotive, uh, as long as it's got um, support, if, as long as it's using the Google Automotive services, you will have um, Google Assistant in there, which will have the capability to do a lot of stuff, um, you know, to control a lot of stuff in your car. That's a, that's one of the other advantages of using Android Automotive is they can interface Google Assistant with that to to control functions, you know, like you know, putting in uh, navigation. If you if you've used Assistant with Android Auto, you know how much better it is than any of the traditional voice recognition systems that are built into the cars. Those are always a pain because, you know, they have very, the, the, the embedded systems in the cars typically have very limited vocabularies and you got to remember very specific commands, like how do you find a point of interest or, you know, put in an address. And, you know, with, with assistant, it's much closer to natural language input. Um, so that, that helps a lot when you're trying to find someplace while you're driving. Fascinating stuff. I'm so happy you could uh, come on and, and break this down uh, for us, Sam. And uh, everybody in chat is, is lighting up about it as well. So that is amazing and uh, explains a lot. And Google, man, their their naming conventions are so confusing. Even if they <laughs> even if they just fixed that, address that in a different way, these things wouldn't be nearly as confusing. It's so easy. I, I can completely understand why so many people misunderstand the differences between Android Auto and Android Automotive. It's just... Mm -hmm. It's just kind yeah. of ridiculous. So. I, it's the it's the branding thing gets me. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's uh, Android Automotive, Android Auto to the average person is the same thing, mm -hmm. even though they're yep. not. Absolutely so. agree. Yeah, they're they're Absolutely they're too, they're they're so close in name, but so totally different. In totally what different. They're capable capable of. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, I hope Leo's enjoying his Maki. -E. I I have to imagine that he probably is. At this point, I he's probably he is. I, screaming I out the week. window, thank you, Sam, as he's driving down the road. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I had one for a week last week, and uh, it was a lot of fun to drive. Yeah, it looks nice. One of these days, maybe he'll take us for a ride when we don't have to dress up in a hazmat suit in order to do it. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, up next, we have a few of your emails that you sent us. And those emails that you sent us came to AAA at twit.tv. Ron, you've got the first one. I do. Our first one comes from our good friend Patrick Olson. Thank you, Patrick, who writes in and says, I had a problem not long ago that many of the songs I added to use as alarms in the clock app were replaced by another alarm song. Then after an Android update in the Google Play Store, they disappeared. When I go to add music for an alarm, I can only add music from the internal storage as I have very little internal storage. I always put media on my micro SD card that has about 100 gig free. Do you have any recommendations on how to resolve this? One can't change one can't change storage location that it gets to gets it to the SD card. Um, OK. And, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm just going to butt in here real quick because I think I misunderstood this when I was reading it up before. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can you can read my notes if you like, Ron. They might they might not be applicable. They might not be applicable. I, I and and what what, they might. what Jason's what Jason's alluding to is this might have to be might be the effect of what's called scope storage, uh, mm. which before Android 11, any app could access nearly any folder or, or file on the drive, whether it's internal storage or an SD fo SD card or whatnot. With Android 11 and the concept of scope storage, apps only have access to their own files by default. Uh, so access to other files outside of its folder require explicit permissions by the user. So the, the thought is that perhaps you can go into the app's permissions and settings and toggle the file and media permission to allow access and see if that fixes it. But Jason, why do you think that won't fix it? I'm just wondering if this is a if this is a support issue. Like I think I missed the micro SD card uh, aspect of this email. I'm wondering if this is just a support issue for the alarm clock app. But I mean, actually, it it probably is scope storage. Like, I don't know why that would sub like it was working before and now suddenly it isn't. Like, I guess my question for Patrick would be, did you update uh, to Android 11 anytime recently? And even if you didn't recently, from my understanding, the scope storage change may have gone in after Android 11, like, hit. 
like maybe it came with an, uh, an update after the fact. I could be misremembering that, but, um, yeah, it very well could be the issue. And, uh, if so, I'd be really curious to know if the, the permission switch would actually address that. I've experienced issues around scope storage while we're talking about it. Have, have, have any have, of yeah. you experienced like in Twitter, if I go to Twitter and I want to share an image from my, uh, from my camera roll, it won't show me everything. It shows me this like small handful of images that I think are just in the in the Twitter folder. And I did some poking around today because of this email and scope storage and everything to see if other and it, apparently it's a thing. But I saw someone on Twitter who works for Twitter um, say that if you go into Twitter's permissions, untoggle this setting, the allow access to, mm. you know, um, to file and media permissions and then re-toggle it again, then it fixes the problem. So, but I do think that it stems from some sort of, you know, misfiring issue that has to do with scope storage would be my guess. But uh, scope storage definitely complicates things when it comes to file management um, versus the way it was Android 10 and before. Uh, I have had issues with, some apps, I, I can't think of which one specifically right now, where you know, for for whatever reason, it can't see certain files, uh, which mm -hmm. uh, clearly sounds like a scope storage thing. You know, when it comes to sh sharing photos and things like that, I always just do that straight from Google Photo. I go into Google Photos and hit sh hit the share button from there and send mm -hmm. it to Twitter anyway. So um, that that part isn't an issue for me. But I, I have seen I have seen issues where certain files just don't seem to appear in the directory when I when I try to open them up from certain apps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It can be a real pain in the butt. Instagram. Um, I'm in the I'm using the beta. I'm in the beta, whatever. I so I get all the beta stuff. Beta, beta. Whatever. Uh but anyway, I have tons of problems with Instagram. Some days it just won't it just will crash when I try and upload a photo. So Oh really interesting. I wonder if that has to do with it. This is this will this is interesting. Uh, and I see, and I see folks on Twitter. I mean, I, I see Artem from mm -hmm. Android police. He tweets a yeah, lot he shared about, something his, about this. Yeah. He tweets a lot about his problems with scope storage. And I've seen just like here and there, you yeah. know, um, this might have to be something that we look into. Yeah. We will keep our Definitely eyes and ears posted on it. Yep. The, the challenges of making the system more secure. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Oh. That's that's kind of the uh, the crummy thing about the scope storage yeah, that's thing because I totally get it. I totally understand why it's there. It just makes certain things less usable. But I'm, that's kind of security, though. <laughs> security really does it, right? Like two-factor authentication yeah. makes you way more secure, but it's not as easy to get into your account. It's one more step, and it's it can be a pain in the butt until you get really used to the process. So, mm -hmm. especially when you enable it right security. in the middle of a show. Yeah, mm -hmm. don't do that. <laughs> yeah, not a good me. idea. <laughs> Never going to live it down. <laughs> nope. Nope. I'm going to take that one to my twit grave. I love that. Uh, oh, that was so great. Oh. <laughs> Flo, you got the next one. So this one is perfectly in tune with today's theme of autos. This one comes in from Kyle from Tampa, Florida. Kyle writes, I was listening to last week's show in my car and was enjoying the conversation everyone was having about Android Auto and in-car audio. I just took this picture and wanted to say that even though I mainly listen to the audio version of the podcast, that is not how I pictured Jason Howe and Florence Ion looking. <laughs> and uh, well, we do you have an attached picture show, of what Kyle is referring to. Now, for the, for the audio listeners, there I'm going to describe to you <laughs> Uh, there is a picture of, I don't know who these people are, but they <laughs> seem to be from an, a hair band of the eighties. Uh, yeah. And I have to say that I actually kind of do have hair that looks like the male more like that. person in, or yeah, <laughs> the guy on the right, you got the bangs. I would you say got that the our bangs. hairstyles are very, I mean, this is what I asked uh, for my stylist. I said, make me look like an eighties dad. So well, I was gonna say, Flo. Happy. I mean, I know, I know you're Bay Area tried and true, but you don't have to get your hair cut like Steve Perry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I haven't been left the house in a while, so not a hard and fast rule. Yes. Now, um, I think what's interesting about this is Kyle, you are not the only person to send this. Yeah, in. In you're fact, not. This is a common. 
this is this is a recurring thing. And and this email just happened to come in, you know, the last couple of days. So I saw it today when I was like collecting emails for the show and realized, Sam, you were going to be on the show, which I mean, is cl- is as close as we've ever been to having someone who might have some earthly idea as to why this happens, because it's not embedded into the ID three information. This is happening in car infotainment systems and mm-hmm. the same image comes up yep. for a lot of people. We've been hearing about this for years. You, you, how people you have been getting this particular image? This? What's Pe- that? People have been getting this particular image for, this particular for image. all about Android? This is not the first yes. time we've seen this. For years. Well, These two people. Based on what I, based on what I can see here, this actually looks like a Toyota screen. That's um, what I was going to and- ask you next, what the UI was. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure this is a Toyota, the Toyota's Entune system, which is always a bit flaky anyway. Um, so my guess is it, it's probably picking this out of some cache that it's got somewhere. Dang. Uh, we need to or, go to Toyota or, or HQ. Or this, <laughs> yeah. It's, that's, a weird, that's a weird one. It is I, weird. I've, I've had cars, you know, pull up odd uh, album art for podcasts, um, you know, on their built-in systems from time to time. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, this is this is definitely a strange one. We've been getting this for years. This is yeah. an, yep. an annual thing that somebody either tweets or emails us about. So if this is truly a Toyota thing, then I would like to propose uh, that we go to Japan. And, uh, you know, once the world is safe again, get some and sushi, we go to Toyota HQ and we knock on the door and we ask them to let us in and we tell them that this is an issue. <laughs> let us in. <laughs> Works for me. I'm, I'm in. For, I'm up for a trip to Japan. This is an issue. <laughs> no, someone in chat said, uh, too bad you can't do a reverse image search. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why can't well, we? Well, yeah, you can take a screenshot, go into Google, take a screenshot of there. Those. Because really, I just want to know who those people the, are. Just the album art. Mm, let's see here. Will I be able I to I want to know this who off? this is. I want to know who I am in this in this world that exists. I bet you Jeez. this is just like some Toyota, <laughs> you know, uh, alternate universe that exists. <gasps> oh, my gosh. I figured Find it out. It? I, who I is it? it out. Who it is? Oh, I love this. This is so great. Okay, so I just put, pasted it in. It's a Giddy Images link, uh, image. Of all about Eve, wow! All about Eve. There it is. United Kingdom, January first photo of all about Eve, which is who is uh, Julianne Reagan. Oh, 1980. 1980 is the is the image. 1980. Oh yeah. Yeah. Date, it says cre- na- date well, created yeah. January first, 1980. Okay, so I wonder if that's accurate because you know what I mean. Like that. That seems like a date that could have just been like uh, a default or something, but maybe so. Yeah. This is a this is a high res looking image. There they are. So there we are, Flo. <laughs> wow, that's us. I'm just like I'm like furiously googling this this English. Yeah, this couldn't have been 1980 because their first their highest charting single Whoa. was 1988. Nice. Whoa, Burke, you you just superimposed her picture on Flo, and there there was some. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is getting weird, guys. It I don't is know who a I weird. am in this alternate universe, and I don't have access to her. So this is really this is this is a lot for me right now. This is this is a lot, but I but you know what? We've gotten one a couple of steps closer to figuring this out. <laughs> we at least now know who they are. We still have no idea why they keep appearing on All About Android. Should we uh, invite them on the show? <gasps> oh, that's that's like next level right there. Yes, now you get, you know, I mean, if you could find them, I doubt they look like this today. I'll just say, I'll just say I mean, they're oh, just England. One, maybe we could have maybe we could have Mateo take a train and go like go find these people and be like. That would be amazing if we got them know, on the you show. Know, you, know what it, you know what it probably is? Um, <laughs> what? A lot of a lot of cars have. Uh, you know, they don't do it so much anymore, but they, they did, they used to have, um, a built-in CDDB database in the car, ah, the Grace Note database, okay. um, with, you know, mm. all the song titles and album art. And right. so, you know, you, when you play, uh, a, an MP3 file, uh, you know, from a USB stick or, you know, right, or just, you know, from the phone or whatever, it would query that built-in CDDB, that Grace Note database and you know pull up the the metadata and it 
it was probably looking for that, you know, because this is he's obviously streaming this, you know, from his phone, uh, just streaming the audio file. And so it's looking in that GraceNote database. It's not finding all about Android. It's finding the next closest thing that it could mm. find, which was all about which Eve. Is all about Eve. And just grabbing uh -huh. that photo. And I uh -huh. love all. Okay, this is great. We're we're finally getting this question answered after I it's know been on six years now. We're getting this this reader it was email. Worth it for me and this to come is on today. the first real explanation we might have for this. Which, thank you, Sam. You've delivered You're us welcome. from some really intense evil. <laughs> all of, all about Eve was an English rock band. Yes, uh, and the bass player who is named Julianne. She was a former journalist. Oh, okay. The band was active from 84 to 93, then 99 to 2004, achieving four UK top 50 albums. Recognized for their unique folk rock influenced take on the gothic rock style. <laughs> Man, this is one of the more epic rabbit holes that we've gone down. <laughs> I know. <on> this show. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Oh, man. Okay. Best of well, here it comes. Wow. Yeah, I feel clarity. I'm just I, I have clarity. It's good. We should probably we should probably get to the uh <laughs> All right. Let's get to the yeah, the uh There you go. the email of the week. I mean, that that <laughs> that could have also been in the email I mean, of the week. We just That didn't should know. have been the email of the week to be honest yeah. with you after all that. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't know, Kyle. So, you are an honorary emailer of the week. So there you go. Thank you, Bert, for keeping up. The uh, official email of the week is <laughs> is Ian Hall. Ian, thank you so much for <laughs> for uh, sending in this email. Ian writes: Jason mentioned the ads his keys his kids see and his experience. I was talking about the ads they see when they're playing games on their tablet. Uh, Ian says, when I saw the sort of inappropriate ads my daughter was seeing in games, she's currently 11, I decided to do something about it. The solution I found to work best is Piehole. It uses a Raspberry Pi as a DNS server on your home network. And when a device tries to get the IP address of a blocked site, the Piehole just says it doesn't exist. Result is that no ads are served and any ad blocking detection doesn't trigger. The solution also works for all devices on the network, so I don't see ads on my TV when viewing catch-up services, for example. Okay, uh, This solution isn't for everyone, as it involves setting up a Raspberry Pi and tweaking networking settings, but that is not so difficult, and there are lots of guides. Piehole is free, and they take donations. I donated on my first day of using it, as it is so good. So that's pi-hole.net if you want to look at it. Or look it up, and, pos and if you have a Raspberry Pi hanging around, I've heard of Pi Hole. I've never used it myself. I, I, I have it. Um, I oh, have two awesome. Raspberry Pis sitting over here, a couple of feet away from me. One, I have a, a, a Raspberry Pi one uh, that's running Pi Hole, and a, a Pi four that's running my Plex server. And uh, okay. Pi Hole is awesome. It, it it is. It's actually pretty easy to set up. Um, it's you know, there's there's lots of step by step guides. In fact, there's. Um, there, if you go through the Twit archives, uh, there's a uh, what was uh, the show that uh, Father Robert did? Um, uh, know how? Know how? Know how? Know how? There's a know how mm -hmm. episode on setting up a pie hole, and he walks you right there through is. the whole process. It's it's really quite easy if you follow that. So you yes. should add that there to the show go. notes. Yeah, episode 355, it looks like. So twit.tv slash H-O-T-355, I think will take you right to that episode. Uh, Father Robert Balasser and Patrick Delahanty talking about how to set up a pie hole. Um, good reference. You know your twit knowledge. My goodness. Um <laughs> Yeah, so so Ian, thank you. That that's an amazing uh, email. I don't want to I don't want to downplay it. It's just really hard to follow. <laughs> it's just really so hard to follow. We had a follow, huge revelation uh, before the yeah. the yeah the 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 thing, the email. Burke, Burke, Burke. <laughs> <Burk. laughs> thank you. Burk, he's yeah. listening. He's not watching the screen. No, no, no. no. <laughs> we're we're confusing Burke because we have different strategies on the email of the week. I, I end up saying it, and he plays it. You wait for him to play it before you say it. So he's confused. I'm and sorry, I Burke. Both. So I like to keep Burke on his toes. 
<laughs> this is the section of the show that really makes Burke sweat. So it used sorry. to be the it used to be the news bumper. Oh, there it is. We're out of time. Thank you, All Sam, right. for coming on the show. Have a good week, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. We, we actually have run out of time. This is a yeah, such a have. fun episode. So and good. Uh, Sam, absolutely, I, I agree with everything Ron just said. You're amazing. Thank you for coming on. I can't believe we haven't done it sooner, and we have to have you back again. Um, tell people a little bit about the Will Bearings podcast and anything you want to leave them with. Yeah, so uh, I do a podcast about uh, cars and automotive technology and mobility with a couple of friends of mine, uh, Dan Roth and uh, Rebecca Lindland, and it's called Wheel Bearings, and you can find it at wheelbearings.media. We uh, we just published our 182nd episode today, um, and uh, I'm also a principal analyst with Guidehouse Insights, uh, where I lead e-mobility ecosystems research, and uh, you can find that. Uh, find out all about us there at guidehouseinsights.com guidehouseinsights.com uh thank you sam um i i okay I, burke do you have that breaking news bumper because i think <laughs> i think it's time for some breaking news oh my i happen to have that ready go ahead and flip that switch oh yeah at the end all of right, the right show down. yeah end of the show right what? right as we're doing our outros uh, in that sign-off block, I went ahead and put a little tweet in there. Wade County in the chat room posted a Twitter link to Julianne Reagan, who is the uh, one of two band members of All About Eve. <laughs> and the tweet itself is very, you know, very underwhelming. It says, rare lockdown pleasures at Simon underscore Reeve with a thumbs up. But if you really zoom in on the bottom, at least in my browser, you see that it was tweeted from Twitter for Android. Da, da, da. Oh. 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 Wow. Excellent. We got to get her on the show. So, so there's, so there's something an Android here. So, an Android user. I see user. it, yeah. I don't know why it doesn't show up on, on whatever Burke's showing for a video, but I see it as the date and the times is Twitter for Android. I wonder yep. if she's posted any photos could we look at the EXIF information uh, to see what phone she's using? She does have a YouTube. I mean, a Facebook. This is amazing. I'm and really sorry to this, this person that we were just like <laughs> stalking I'm in gonna, live. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and follow her. And nice. uh, I realize that start a dialogue. She's not, she's not followed by anyone that I'm following yet. So she's off the radar. I don't want to freak her out either, but this might actually happen, y'all. <laughs> this would be amazing. <laughs> this would, yeah, this would be some huge fan service, and I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> totally here for it. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, everybody in chat, for doing your investigative work. That is amazing. Uh, amazing. <laughs> there we go. Okay, Flo, what do you want to promote? Um, I, You know, I'm just promoting me. <laughs> I'm Flo and Zion. <laughs> You can go to florenceion.com and that's my website and blog. I'm on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat at oh that flow. Um, I'm on Twitter as I should have said earlier and I do another podcast on the Relay FM network with Andy and Natco called Material if you want to get a little more into the nitty-gritty of the business side of things when it comes to Android. So that's me. Indeed. And you should absolutely subscribe to uh, Material. It's a great show. Thank yeah, you, Sam. Absolutely. You've always been you always been very supportive of that of that <laughs> medium. <laughs> yes, Material is awesome. Thank you, Flo. Also, Ron, what you got? Uh, not much. I just looked on at a photo she posted, and the EXIF does not have the source device. Unfortunately, I do know what color oh. profile she's using though. Maybe um, maybe she is wise enough in technology to strip the EXIF data before she shares online. Maybe I will say that the the yeah. the it's a three point two megapixel photo. So if you could back that into you know like some figure out what phones take photos at three point two point three point two megapixel. Um, yeah, who knows? Also, it could have been crunched by by Twitter. So I don't know if it I'm could getting be, the true yeah. 
source image. Yeah. But anyway, um, that said, you can follow me uh, on Twitter and on Instagram at RonXO. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, go check out scorebit.io, uh, the website for my pinball company. Uh, yeah, we just we released a new update to the app uh, today, actually. So uh, yeah. uh, a, a minor update, some bug fixes and some uh, new ways to bubble up your scores. But uh, but yeah, so check it out, scorebit.io. Thank you. Excellent. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Jason Howell. I do other shows here on the Twit Network, including uh, Tech News Weekly this Thursday with my co-host Micah Sargent. And uh, yeah, that's about all I really need to promote today. Uh, don't forget to wear a mask. Please continue doing that. Save lives. And really, you know, we, we as humanity really appreciate it. Uh, but that is it for this week's episode. What a fun episode it's been. Uh, don't forget to go to twit.tv slash AAA. That's what our show page on the web. You can find everything you need to know about the show. All the ways to subscribe, link out to YouTube, uh, video player, audio player embedded in the page. Everything you need is right there. And uh, outside of that, yeah, it kind of looks like that, except for all about Android and not know how, although that's pretty cool too. Uh, and I think that's it. We'll end it there. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next week on another episode of All About Android. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for tuning in to another show here on the Twit Network. If you are a fan of home automation, Internet of Things, and all things smart technology, you should check out my podcast, Smart Tech Today. I do it with Matthew Casanelli, and we have so much fun talking about all the latest news for all things smart tech.